Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Gary Miller. Uh, once again, I am the guest host of Hired the Podcast. Uh, I'm muscling Travis Miller out. I don't know he's not, what he thinks about all this, but I'm here today with Adam Crandall. Uh, Adam is the Chief Resonue, Revenue Officer for Adtronics, formerly was the VP of Sales for Dynamic Design Solutions, and Adtronics recently acquired Dynamic Design Solutions, and Adam became the Chief Revenue Officer of the uh, whole operation. So, Adam, uh, please uh, comment on that and edit my introduction if it needs it. <laughs> hey, Gary, thanks for having me today. So, like you mentioned in your beautiful introduction, my name is Adam Crandall. I am the Chief Revenue Officer here with Adtronics. Uh, previously the Chief Revenue Officer and VP of Sales and Marketing with Dynamic Design Solutions, headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. And like you mentioned, through an incredible acquisition this past October, uh, we were the first brand or portfolio company that was brought into the Adtronics group of companies. And uh, very proud to be acquired by Adtronics. Adtronics is a holding company that was formed from Caho Partners, which is a private equity firm to basically build a world-class automation company throughout the entire United States to revitalize and reshore American manufacturing. So could not be more excited today to represent Adtronics and be a guest on your podcast and have a little conversation about hopefully American manufacturing, talent acquisition, and some of the things that we're doing very different than the rest of the industry, I believe. Well, that's, uh, that's a good trifecta right there. Uh, looking forward to explore all of them. Um, so reshoring, uh, promoting American manufacturing. I think everybody that will listen to this and anybody that should listen to this uh, is interested in that. Uh, it seemed like offshoring was a good idea two or three decades ago, and now yeah. not so much. So, so talk to me a little bit about why that's so important for uh, the good old U.S. of A. right now. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, Gary. So I think uh, when Kyle Partners formed Adtronics, one of the reasons why they formed it was they work with a lot of other companies that they have ownership of that were having labor challenges, and they saw supply chain issues. They experienced the companies that were part of Caho that said, we are having problems making and manufacturing the day-to-day -day goods that the United States and us as consumers need. So in talking to these companies, uh, a light bulb went off to our founders, Max and Griffin at Caho, to say, huh, if we have a labor challenge, how do we help them overcome this and basically beat the supply chain issues? And one way they did that was by forming Adtronics. And they said, we're going to bring American manufacturing back from overseas. We know it's a big challenge because labor is much more cost effective overseas. But one way we can do that by contributing to the U.S. economy, providing great paying jobs is by reshoring through automation. And Caho Partners did exactly that when they formed Adtronics. So I could not be more proud to be a part of that group. Their main mission is literally to revitalize and reshore American manufacturing. They're helping companies every single day within their own portfolio. And now companies through the dynamic design portfolio and also our second acquisition, MTA, Missouri Tooling and Automation, they're now helping their customers through automation and our automation capabilities. Is that, uh, that's a, a newer acquisition, correct? Missouri Tooling? Yeah. Yeah, so Dynamic Design was the first acquisition, first of many, I like to say, but that happened in October of 2022. And MTA was just acquired at the end of January, our second acquisition. Uh, a great group, about 50 people in Lebanon, Missouri, uh, Bob Archer and David Hopkins and Brian, uh, three great individuals oversee that company's operation, and they're now part of the Adtronics family to bolster our capabilities and, again, contribute to revitalizing and reshoring American manufacturing and Adtronics. How, how does their expertise or area of specialization differ from DDS? Yeah, it's a great compliment, Gary. So uh, DDS specializes 
in a really good niche market uh, when it comes to pick and place and vision guided robotics and inspection systems. And they do a lot in automotive, power and energy, CPG and packaging. But when we acquired MTA, our second acquisition, it brought a whole new breadth of operational exposure to our, our portfolio. And some of their experience, they get into semiconductor, cannabis, uh, medical device, life sciences, really an area that DDS doesn't play in a lot. So we're very excited to uh, benchmark from some of their best practices and really open up our operational expertise now and leverage what they have at MTA in Missouri to now start really taking care of more customers and expanding our reach across the United States. And again, I look at that where maybe a product that was made in China or India or Mexico yesterday can now be bought back to the United States because MTA and DDS with Edtronics can now provide jobs here through automation. Uh, uh, I'm a layman in this. I don't understand the economics and the, uh, how that works, uh, how that relates to the supply chain issues, et cetera. But I'm Joe Consumer. No, I'm really Gary Miller, but pretend I was Joe Consumer. I'm in Chicago <laughs> here and I want to, I'm buying a product that yep. uh, otherwise would have been bought in China. Cheaper was the promise, right? Um, and then the technology improved. So why buying it in the, from a USA manufacturer, how does that benefit me, the consumer today? Yeah, great point. So uh, a few things right now, um, you know, to, to kind of focus on some challenges that we're having geopolitically, uh, we have a lot of adversaries overseas, unfortunately, right now. We have geopolitical unrest in Ukraine with Russia. Uh, China right now is really kind of saber rattling in the Asia Pacific area when it comes to Taiwan. And most people don't know it, but a lot of our defense industry is heavily reliant on Taiwanese semiconductor plants. And one of the things right now that we're excited about is we can help aerospace defense contractors hopefully bring back some of that manufacturing from Taiwan to help us not be so reliant on these overseas areas that in the future we may have some challenges with if we have some of our adversaries uh, take these regional type conflict approaches that we're currently seeing right now. So I look at it from the standpoint of we increase our security in the United States and also just basic goods outside of the semiconductor chip issue, uh, things that maybe have taken a long time with the recent issues we've had in our ports on the West Coast that now the East Coast is seeing a lot of effects on. If we can make that in the United States and do that in automation, product availability to consumers will still be very high and your price will still be competitive because you may now have a robot that is manufacturing that product that previously was being made in China or never be ever considered before to be made in the United States by paying an individual maybe in an exorbitant wage to do that mm -hmm. actual function. So, um, but if I'm somebody that really doesn't Let's say again, Beck. I'm Joe Consumer. I just want to. I just want to go to uh, Target and buy the thing I'm looking for. And yeah. It didn't. It doesn't occur to me like where the chips are that are going into that product or et cetera. You know, I I bought a toothbrush at Costco last week. Electric toothbrush. Probably a bunch of chips in it. Motors. Who knows what? I just want a toothbrush and I want it yeah. now. So. Uh, if somebody, is it just going to be cheaper and more available if it's made in the USA? So I would say it'll be more available because you're bringing the manufacturing back to the United States. Our supply chain now is less reliant on a country overseas to make that product. So we're not going to have issues when it comes to shipping, exporting, potentially a tariff cost. Also, we saw it during COVID-19 pharmaceutical companies. We had all of these major challenges and we're seeing it even right now with antibiotics. Companies that manufacture key antibiotics, if you go to your local CVS, you might not be able to get those antibiotics. There's a shortage. Baby formula. I'm a father right now of a, a newborn, an eight-month-year-old, and baby formula is sold out everywhere. Huge concern as a new parent. And that's a great example. To your point, Gary, you look at going to buy a toothbrush. New moms can't even get baby formula right now. You bring that back to the United States, you automate those manufacturing facilities where they can't find people to work. These plants can't find people to come in and actually manufacture these critical products like baby food. And now 
You set up automation, you invest in these manufacturing facilities in the United States, you reduce the dependencies of overseas supply chains, and you can get the product quicker, and hopefully, if not cheaper, at least at the same cost that you're currently paying right now when shopping from a product that's manufactured in China. So I want to come at this from a different angle. So I was talking to the, uh, uh, a, bo- a board member of a technical association in the Midwest here just yesterday. And um, in the Midwest, I don't know if you're aware of this, but within like 30 miles of O'Hare Airport is one of the biggest concentrations of uh, small manufacturing companies anywhere in the, in the USA or maybe the world. Wow. Um, just, you know, under 100 employees, but they make a lot of things. They make a lot of stuff. Anyway. He was talking to them. They're, they're a, a small association. They brought in somebody to talk about Industry 4.0, automation. Yeah. yeah. He said, unfortunately, most of them rated themselves only at about level 2.0. Wow. They're, they're just about to take their first step. What's the biggest fear that most companies have about taking that first step into automation? What holds them yeah. back? What holds them back? Great question. So I think to your point, Gary, some of these smaller manufacturers, maybe they're family owned like DDS was at one point. The first thing they think of automation is it's going to take our people's jobs. And I can completely say that statement is false. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the big hurdles you got to overcome is you have to educate these manufacturers. We're helping people that have safety issues, ergonomic issues, or that are doing work that's very repetitive and not value added to the organization. And we can repurpose those individuals to become more valuable. So if you can overcome that first hurdle and educate these companies that it's actually going to help their bottom line, it's going to help their employee morale, that's a big win. I think the other major concern to your point, this industry 4.0 buzz right now that everyone's talking about is the security concerns on the network and programming issues. I, I think, again, as an expert in the industry in automation, systems integrators need to also work and be very gentle and educate manufacturers on if we connect to your network, we have a way to make it secure. If we partner with you with robotics, we can make them safe and secure. So I think people have a lot of fear right now on what happens if they connect to my network? What happens if they put a robot in? Is there a safety concern? Will they replace the people that we've hired and invested so much time in? And if they're not used to that, I can empathize with that. It can be scary. But as an expert in the industry, we need to do our job to educate these companies and really inform them the truths and the myths that are out there right now. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised. Well, you know, you and I live, breathe, sleep. I mean, I come at it from a different angle as a recruiting company, but we watch the industry for a living and talk to people in the industry for a living, and and you do too. I'm surprised that these that companies like this aren't further along in their own education process. I'm surprised they're like not right at the, uh, the entry point and say, let's go. So it's just, uh, you'd think, you'd think they were closer. Yeah. It's Gary, you bring up a good point. And I, I actually, uh, I'll, I'll chat about that. I think what your statement is, is surprising, but it's not surprising because in manufacturing, the industry is so historically traditional where they've always done it a certain way, some of these companies. And if you're comfortable and you've made money, you've made profit, you haven't had those pressures, which now COVID-19 has created a whole world of post-pandemic supply chain issues. And again, this reshoring American manufacturing, this idea was really never front and center previously. And today, companies now are saying, well, we can't find workers now. So you have these pressures that were never truly there before. You have these threats that companies are now experiencing where they weren't having these types of pressures on their doorstep that didn't really exponentially push them to your point of embracing automation. But I think that's going to change pretty quickly. We're seeing companies that never even broached the subject of automation or robotics to now this day going into conferences, trade shows. We're seeing trade shows at an all-time high of people returning to these again Mm -hmm. because people are craving to understand what does automation mean and what can it do for their business. So I think the pendulum is swinging now to your point where people are going to be farther along in the years to come. 
Yeah, I think uh, automate this year in uh, Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, it, and I'm we belong to several associations, but uh, uh, the Association for Advancing Automation and the work they A3, do. A three, great the, organization. The buzz around that uh, association, the growing membership, the attendance at Automate this year. I think people will be lucky to get a hotel room within 20 miles of the place. I agree. It's unbelievable. We just came back from ATX West in IME in West in uh, the Anaheim area. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't believe the turnout. And to your point, people that are showing up at the booth going, we're just starting to explore automation. We've neglected it, but now we're all in. We want to know how we can begin to automate in our plants. Yeah, I I think... uh... Like 20 years ago, imagine somebody saying, you know what, I don't need a cell phone. Yeah. Um, so, or I don't need a GPS system. Right. Yeah, I, I like my maps. <laughs> so anyway, I can, can you imagine a company 20 years from now that has no automation? I don't see that even being possible. I think there will be companies that will be out there like that, but they won't be in business long. And I kind of look at that, Gary, where... Companies right now that we're talking to are automating to keep their competitive edge and competitive advantage in today's global economy. And those that aren't are getting left behind. And I always use the case study. And again, you have the two major filmmakers. I won't name them because everyone knows who they are. But one went digital. One didn't want to go digital. They've lost almost 90,000 employees from my hometown in Rochester, New York. Companies that aren't embracing the new digital industry 4.0 and automation robotics kind of initiative, they're going to get left behind. And I don't think you're going to see many companies that will be able to not embrace it in the coming years. Yeah, well, this is going to sound cynical, but there might be something for those companies that don't automate to do 20 years from now. I live in Naperville and there's a, uh, a vi- little village called Naper Settlement. And you can go there and you can see a blacksmith operating, you know, in his original <laughs> so those companies might be like novelties or museums where like a, collect, like a collector's item right yeah, How so you used can to go do look at the, the way day. it used to be done but anyway i want to uh, shift the conversation a little bit uh because uh labor saving uh, robots and systems whatnot that's the manual labor part of it but to um you know design to sell design structure, implement, program, maintain these automated systems requires another level of skill and another uh, chunk of the workforce. And there's, a, as we both know, there's a ton of demand for yeah. engineers, programmers, design people, oh, electro, uh, electrical, electronic, mechanical engineers. Um, it's an insatiable des- desire for these people. Hottest job right now in the market. If you want to get a job out of college, this is where I would be putting my efforts into. And indeed. Uh, and, and everybody at every conference we go to talks about workforce development. And we're down into the high schools and the grade schools with trying to get them interested in manufacturing. And I think we'll get there. I think that awareness uh, piece has been, that's been um, uncovered. Let's So, so I yeah. think everybody knows that we have to do that. And, and frankly, manufacturing is going to be a lot more interesting than it used to be. Yeah, exactly. You know, it used to be, there used to be an image of dark, dirty, dungy, and dangerous, right? And yep. now it's They don't more... talk about it in the local colleges. They don't talk about it in your high school to go into manufacturing for our young professionals. It's very disappointing. And I think that narrative is changing now. Yes, for sure. And the, the, uh, uh, an automated factory uh, in its prime probably looks pretty cool. It's a little more Star Wars-like yeah, uh, than it used to be. And that'll get a lot of uh, people interested. However, so if, if every company that sells automation, uh, integrates automation, services automation, uh, programs automation, they all need talent. And so there's competition for those kind of people as well. And uh, we, oh, for sure. we have a premise. Uh, we try to help our clients that If you want to attract people, you have to be attractive. And we encourage people to be very active digitally, like their website, their uh, social media presence, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to say, 
uh, observing you, you're you're almost like a poster child. You're like the role model for how do you use social media to tell your company's story, to promote what you do, but also to promote your people, promote careers at your company. You you do a phenomenal job there. So I, I want to I appreciate that. How did that get started? When did you decide to take that journey? And how has that helped you stand out as an employer of choice? Yeah, that's a, a great point, Gary. So I look at companies in the industry today and really manufacturing, uh, again, been around for 50, 75, 100 years. Digital marketing and social media was never really a tool that they either embraced or thought of. Uh, I'm a millennial, almost 36 years old. I work with a lot of millennials, and part of my playbook is bringing in young people that understand these new type of high-tech tools to reach the masses. Uh, one of the things people have to understand when they're doing research on the new B2B buyer, they're Gen Z and millennials, they're young people, and they're coming in the manufacturing industry in droves. How do you reach out to young people? Well, you do it via social media. You do it via the website, where previously... That wasn't the case when we look at employees in manufacturing 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we've taken a different approach in our playbook where we have a full-blown LinkedIn strategy. We're using TikTok. We're using Facebook. We're using Instagram. We're using all of these different digital avenues to reach out, share our story, talk about our incredible culture, and the things that Adtronix does so well in comparison to some of the other companies that may not take the approach that we take. Also, you know, my model is culture eats strategy for lunch any day. Not saying that strategy and experience isn't important, but you have a poor culture or you treat your employees in a poor manner and you only focus on the results, then at that point, you're not going to have a successful business and your customers are going to feel that. So our whole approach is focusing on a people first type approach. We tell our story on social media. We show all of the incredible things that we're doing. And we, we spotlight our employees on a weekly basis on what it's like to work here at Adtronix. Mm -hmm. And then have you, um, you're, you're probably, I'm sure you're growing and adding people on a regular basis. Growing like crazy. We've doubled our workforce in a year and a half, Gary. Do the, uh, when you're interviewing people, do they comment? Do they notice that? They do. So, I had, uh, I had a customer down in South Carolina last week that we talked about and said, Adam, I feel like I know you. I see your face on LinkedIn like every three days you're posting about something. And, you know, my boss kind of chuckled, but I looked at it and I said, this is exactly why we're doing this. We're trying to embed ourselves in these people's minds and their businesses. So when they look at how do they solve their most complex manufacturing challenges, they look and they go, I remember DDS. I remember MTA. They're part of Edtronix, which are solving some of the biggest issues in manufacturing. Let's give them a call. So that's kind of the approach that, that we use, and people are recognizing it today. What, uh, so you're, how many, 50 employees? Or you said so Edtronix is about 100 employees combined through okay. our two companies that we've acquired, MTA and DDS, for about 100, 100 people. So in your uh, wildest dreams, uh, how, how, if you can share, if it's not proprietary, um, how big do you think you can be? What's the grandest vision you have for your company? Yeah, so uh, part of the leadership team here at Adtronic, some of the discussions that we're having is, you know, we would love to acquire about two to three uh, integrators or, or companies in the automation space every single year. So we see that vision where we're looking to bring in companies in our, our fold over the next five to seven years. Uh, we are a buy and build. We're not just a, a private equity buy and flip in the next three years. Our investors are very interested in the space. They're very committed to investing money to make sure that we can, again, reshore American manufacturing, stay consistent to that, uh, really that message. And we're not looking for all and every companies. We're not looking to turn companies around. We're pretty picky. We're looking for companies that are profitable, that have good cultures, that invest in their employees, and that just kind of have hit a limit where maybe their owner's looking to retire. They've taken it to the next level, but they just can't seem to get over that hump. And then they want to have a, a further investment to take their business to a level they haven't seen before. Uh, is it difficult to find those kind of prospects? I think it's challenging, but just like DDS and MTA, they are out there. And there are definitely multiple scenarios, Gary, where 
these owners that have built these companies from scratch, they started these companies, they have been their babies like DDS and MTA, and they're ready to take it to the next level. And we're talking right now to many companies, even after these two acquisitions, that are very similar to a DDS or an MTA that's going to strengthen our umbrella of companies, and it's going to make Edtronics an even stronger uh, automation company going forward. Uh, share with me who those companies are you're considering. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wish I could, right? No, no, no. Unfortunately, we're under NDA and, and confidentiality. For sure. Um, so back to, so I want to poke, probe a little more into culture a little bit. Yeah. Because that, there's so many companies that say, oh, yeah, it's our culture, it's our people. Well, everybody says that, and maybe that's just right. the only answer you can give because there's no two people alike, which means no two cultures are exactly alike. But yeah. when you say our culture, our people, if everybody says that, and then so now I'm going to go, go deeper with me on that. What is it really uh, uh, beyond, beneath the surface um, that makes DDS stand out or Adtronic yeah. stand out? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, again, why Atronic stands out from a culture standpoint, Gary, is really a few things at a high level. So number one, all of our employees get the opportunity to participate in profit sharing. So if the company is profitable and does well, we're giving that back to our hardworking employees every single day. And our employees get to participate in that. I've never personally worked for a company coming from Fortune 100 to small, medium-sized enterprises, to now where I am today, that actually says we're going to take a portion of our profit and physically give it back to our employees. That's unbelievable. So we do that, and employees feel like they have ownership in it. With the Edtronics acquisition of DDS and MTA, the next thing is individuals, as they continue to contribute to the organization, they'll actually have the opportunity to get some equity in the organization, which is also pretty incredible. Again, I never had an opportunity until coming to Edtronics to have some equity in a business, which really makes me feel like I'm ingrained in the mission and I can give back to the company that I'm working hard for every day. So I look at it kind of to start out where Edtronics gives their employees skin in the game, and a lot of companies don't do that. But I think it goes even further, Gary, beyond that. It starts with the departmental leaders in each unit. And when I was at DDS as the VP of Sales and Chief Revenue Officer, I looked at it as, yeah, they do performance reviews, managers, yeah, they give raises, yeah, they give promotions, but how many managers are actually sitting down or leaders every day and putting together development plans and asking employees, what are your personal goals? And doing what we call stay interviews. Employees do exit interviews when they get exited from a company or they resign, but since when do you realize that a leader goes out and says, we're going to do stay interviews every quarter to see if our employees can give us direct feedback on why do they want to continue to work here and then focus on those things. So I look at it as our company does the things that other companies' leaders aren't doing. And I know this from talking in the industry, networking with leaders. I had a leader in the manufacturing industry say to me, well, they have a job. That's good enough. They should just get their job done punch the clock eight to five. If they don't like it, they can go work somewhere else. Gen Zs and millennials aren't operating that way anymore. They have to have a purpose. They have to feel like they're part of the mission. They have to feel like the work that they're involved in is special or adding value to our economy. And I look at that where I coach my leaders and I take that approach where when I'm working with these individuals, this different leadership style goes a long way. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, again, in, in terms of leadership and, and uh, for what's appropriate for today, especially for people early in their career, that sounds, again, like uh, you're a role model. Or lead uh, the this charge, clip, Gary. This clip may go viral. You know, you could be on the cover of Business Week yet. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm curious, you didn't start your career in automation. How did you, uh, how did you wind up in the field? I did not. So I actually had an incredible opportunity right out of college. I joined an amazing company called VWR International. Mm -hmm. uh, they were acquired and, and now they are a publicly traded company under the organization called Avantor Health Sciences. I met some incredible leaders at that company that mentored me, developed me, and I joined their leadership development program. Spent about eight years 
And I had a boss named D. Kerr that took a chance on me and every 18 months promoted me into a different role because of my skill set, passion, and energy. And I looked back and I said, well, if someone took a chance as a young 22-year-old when I entered the workforce, I'm going to give those same opportunities to people that have that kind of passion and dedication that work for me. So I learned that trait on how to treat people and develop people early on. I went from there to then a company that does technical ceramics in another manufacturing house in the upstate New York area. Mm -hmm. Spent a few years there and then went to a company in upstate New York that does automation, just like DDS. And after a few years of breaking into the automation industry in 2018, uh, Dynamic Design gave me a call, a headhunter, just like the Miller Resource Group here, and said, we got this incredible opportunity down in Charlotte. I said, well, let me think here. Lower taxes, sunny weather, I can get out of upstate New York, and I love this industry. Went down for an interview, and in 2019, I began my journey here at DDS. And looking back at almost four years later, uh, was the best career decision I ever made. I didn't know where it was going to take my family and I when we made the move, but then we get acquired by you know, a world-class PE firm, an opportunity to join these individuals at the C-suite to now take this culture model and this leadership model that I believe in so strongly and extrapolate it across every company that we acquire here at Adtronics. So you're originally from uh, upstate New York? Yeah, originally born and raised 30 plus years in Rochester, New York, little town called Greece, New York, where I went to high school at Greece, Athena, spent, uh, again, a third of my life up there and now moved down to the Charlotte, North Carolina area in uh, 2021. So I've been down in the Carolinas now about two years. How many kids in your high school? Oh, man. So my graduating class was about 400, just my graduating class. And my town, Gary, had five high schools. So we were in a, just my town. So we, I, I, came, I come from a big town. Yeah, it's a similar. I, I, was in, I had 400 in my graduating class, but it was all boys. Wow. <laughs> so... Um, uh, also, uh, I'm sorry, I can't be, I, I can't turn off my interview hat here. What, uh, growing up, what was your favorite activity that you were most passionate about? Yeah. So it's kind of funny when I was growing up, I loved sports, super competitive. I was big into soccer and basketball, really enjoyed all that. And uh, you fast forward and you kind of look at how your hobby shapes your career path. I was a pre-med student at University of South Carolina, the USC, by the way. I know uh -huh. everyone says U University of South California, but um, I was pre-med and uh, went into a operating room with my practitioner and uh, never can burn in the memory out of my head of a, a surgery that I saw. And I said, oh, I can't deal with the sight of blood and surgery. This isn't for me. And uh, my mentor called me later that day and said, Adam, what are you doing in pre-med? You can sell anything to anyone. You should go into sales. And, uh, you know, again, the competitive spirit in sports led to pre-med, which then really kind of came full circle to, I need to get into business, I need to get into sales. And now as the chief revenue officer, I'm responsible for all sales, marketing, and every revenue generating topic here at Edtronic. So it all kind of started there from a hobby. Well, uh, you certainly seem to have uh, almost all the sales characteristics uh, I've ever seen. So I'm sure that... Uh... Your optimism is going to take you far. Got to have optimism. Yeah. You know, optimists are disappointed a lot, but they also know how to fight through it. That's true, right? It's not about just uh, what you see as, as hopefully the good and the bad, but it's how you deal with it, right? Right. All right. So if somebody wants to join uh, your team, what are three traits that stand out that you look for? Yeah. So I would say... It's really funny when we go out in the industry, Gary, our sales force, not one of them come from the automation industry. They're all, you know, very under the age of 35, young professionals. They don't have a solid automation robotics background. And I would say some of the things we look for is with that group, be open minded. If you're open and you're moldable, I love people that we call coachable. If you can come in and learn a technical product and have a great attitude and take feedback. I love coachable people. The second thing is we look for employees that are engaged and have that passion. You can't teach passion. You can teach a sales fundamental or a finance fundamental, but someone that comes in and has a great attitude, that has a passion to win, we look for that. And I think lastly, I don't hire someone because they've been in the industry or they have a book of business in the industry. I hire the right person 
for the right job. And some of those things are hard skills that we look for. Can they sell? Can they close business? But again, my mentors, the leadership programs, I'm in Vistage International right now, which is a uh, coaching leadership organization for CEOs. They've always taught me hire the best person for the job based on their makeup. Don't look at them just because they have a track record, a solid resume, because half the time you bring in that person, they may not be a right fit for the job. So those are some of the things that I look at when I interview candidates to join the commercial team here at Edtronix. Yeah, that's a great summary. I, I remember that I was in Vistage for 10 years, about 10 years ago, and there was a consultant that they brought in. And I think the he said you should there's three buckets. There's uh uh personality traits, there's experience uh levels, and there's skills. And most people look for skills and experience, where he said actually it's the personality traits that are most Culture significant. Fit. Yep, for sure. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's great. So um uh summarizing here, then I'll I'll put the put you on the spot here. If I'm a candidate yeah. and I'm interviewing with you. And it's the end of the interview and your toes tapping because you like me as a candidate, but I've got choices. Yeah. And I look you in the eye and I say, Adam, if I work for you, what will I become? Great question. How would you answer it? Yeah. So I would look at that question, Gary, and I would say at Edtronix, the opportunities are truly endless. There's no glass ceiling here at Edtronix. So if you want to get into leadership, we're going to put a plan together to help you get to a leadership role. If you want to just be a sales performer, travel, be in outside sales, and service customers in the manufacturing industry, we're going to help you be the best at that specific role. So I look at it when a candidate asks me that. I say, like my mentor said to me when I was 23 years old, I said, D, you just joined the organization here at VWR. What are your goals and objectives? And she smiled at me and said, what are your goals and objectives? And I said, D, I asked you first. And she said, no, I want to hear yours. And I said, I want to be a chief revenue officer one day. I want to be a CEO of a private company. Gave her all these things. And she sat back in her chair and smiled and said, everything you just listed, those are my goals as your leader. So I would say to candidates, what you're looking to achieve in your personal life and how it ties into your career and your professional life, that's something that Adtronics can give candidates here that I don't think other companies are truly focused on. Oh, well, that's great. That's a great. If I was in my youth, I'd want to be on your team. I appreciate that. It's an exciting team to be on. Good, good, good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're, uh, we're wrapping up here today. Um, you've just spent uh, 30 minutes or so with Adam Crandall. We've got to know Adtronics. We've got to know DDS. We've got to know about their company. We've talked about American manufacturing, automation, onshoring, but mostly we've got to know what makes uh, Adam Crandall tick. So That's right. peek inside. So Adam, thank you very much. Thank you. This has been another episode of Hired the Podcast. Tune in wherever you listen to podcasts to, to listen to this clip with Adam Crandall. Gary, thanks for having me on. We appreciate it. And again, for companies that are hurting right now for talent, should be reaching out to companies like the Miller Resource Group to help fill those open roles. So I really appreciate your time today. All right. Thank you very much.